Yo, what up? Welcome to Made by Ozzy. I'm Ozzy and I am super excited because this is the first video of my crypto series. And with the new series comes a fr brand new fresh shave. I was getting pretty fuzzy in the last video, but uh, all right. So I'm probably not going to shave again until we get this, cri this uh, cryptocurrency miner actually working. Um, so if you're if this is the first video you're watching on my channel uh, i've actually got a whole nother playlist already done called fpga essentials because what this channel is working on is trying to get a cryptocurrency miner written that will actually work with this fpga sitting right here um so if you don't know anything about FPGAs, you could check out that series because I literally walk you through every step from installing the software all the way to actually putting a finished design on the board and having some little Python scripts to work with it. I got a link for that playlist in the description below and as well for the GitHub that we've been working out of. That whole playlist is populated to GitHub. I got a Python project already started in there and we're just going to carry on with that same GitHub. Link for that in the description below. So in this episode, what I want to do today is just discuss all of the technical details that we need to know to just plan out what, what is a Bitcoin miner, what software do we write, what, what when we start writing lines of code, what are they going to do, right? Um, so this is a real high level overview of the technical details that we need to know. We're not going to write any code today. We're just going to plan the code that we're going to write over the next two episodes. So let's go ahead and get started. Over here on madebyozzy.com, I went ahead and listed out the data that we need to get from any crypto network, be it, you know, Bitcoin or Digibyte or whatever, Litecoin. They all pretty much use the same uh, information for the proof of work mining protocol. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. What we need to get is the version. And that, that's uh, real simple. It's just straight up the version of the code that's running. Um, the previous hash, which is uh, the hash of the block header of the last block that made it through, um, which is you know what makes it a chain and hence blockchain. Um, the Merkle root, which we'll get into in just a second. Uh, timestamp is just your standard run of the mill timestamp. Uh, and then you also need the num bits, which is uh, how you calculate the difficulty, um, which uh, uh, is gonna dictate uh, what type of hash output is actually acceptable and will be accepted by the network at that time. Um, as more people are mining, the difficulty goes up, you know, etc. Um, and then the nonce. This is what we're actually guessing for in our miner. We are going to be um, basically guessing every single possible value of this nonce and hoping that that returns a hash value that is below the difficulty prescribed by this n bits. We're going to take those six variables and we're going to concatenate them all together to create a total of 80 bytes or 640 bits. And this array of bits is what we're going to pass through our hashing algorithm, which is going to return to us a 256 bit digest. And our goal as miners is to find a combination of these six variables that when we push it through a hashing algorithm returns to us a digest, which satisfies the um, difficulty specified by the n bits parameter. The version, the previous block header hash, and the n bits or the difficulty, those are all set in stone. We, we can't change those at all. We have to use what the network tells us. However, the other things, the Merkle tree specifically has a lot of variability built in. The timestamp, we could actually play with a good bit. And the nonce is actually just any random value within that 32 bit range. Okay, and a Merkle root is a just a convenient fingerprint of a whole series of transactions or a whole you know group list array whatever of transactions. So you have this uh, some number of transactions, and you want to um, have like a unique fingerprint for uh, all of them in there. Um, and so we do that by constructing a Merkle root. Um, and so what a Merkle root, it's, it's a pretty straightforward implementation. You take every transaction, you hash it by itself, and then you concatenate the hash of those, and you hash it by itself, and you just repeat that until you get up to uh, one root. The Merkle root can vary wildly from miner to miner. You know, if there's a thousand transactions sitting in the mempool, then miner A can build one using only the first 500, and miner B can build one building only the last 500, and both of them have an equal shot of producing a valid block header that they could, uh, you know, throw onto the blockchain to claim that block reward. Um, usually, miners just choose to include as many transactions as they can, prioritizing in favor of those that provide the highest transaction fees. Mining is a business, right? You're trying to get as much income from mining these blocks as you possibly can. Part of the Merkle tree is the Coinbase transaction, which is a very special type of transaction. It's how all new coins are created on any given, on, on any, they're called UTXO or unspent transaction output chains, which includes Bitcoin and it includes Digibyte. Um, 
So every single coin that exists um, is always tracked by a transaction that came before it. So every coin eventually can be tracked back to its original Coinbase transaction. Um, so the amount of new coins that are generated with each Coinbase transaction is reduced over time. The Bitcoin's emission schedule is it has a halving more or less every four years, something like that, give or take. Um, uh, because it's set by blocks, not by time. Uh, so it started at 50 Bitcoin per block. And after three halvings, we're now down to 6.25 Bitcoin per block. Uh, Digibyte has a different emission schedule. It um, reduces by 1% every month, again, give or take, because it's set by number of blocks, not by time. Um, so it started, um, I believe in 2014, at like 1500 Digibyte per block. And now we're down to about like 500 something like that eventually for both of these networks for any network that uses proof of work like this the amount of coins created over time will eventually drift towards zero at that point the only uh income left for miners the only mining incentive left is completely from transaction fees the coinbase transaction itself actually has a lot of variability built into it um, miners can actually embed any random data they want into it. Uh, in fact, you may have heard of the original message embedded into the very first block of the Bitcoin blockchain by the creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. It said, it's an article from the Times, like in 2009, Chancellor on the second brink of bailout for banks. You know, it was like a little philosophical message showing why we want Bitcoin, right? Um, in fact, uh, in the first block after this last halving, or maybe in the last one, I'm not sure, uh, last one right before the having, but the mining pool, which um, uh, mined that particular block, uh, embedded another little message here. Let me, uh, I wrote it down here. It's uh, uh, with $2.3 trillion injection, Fed's plan far exceeds 2008 rescue. Oh man, I, I just love Bitcoiners. They, uh, they got a real, uh, you know, tongue in cheek messages. Um, in fact, so uh, in the first block of the Digibyte blockchain, the creator Jared Tate embedded the message, um, uh, target data stolen from up to 110 million customers. So he was very clearly trying to intend this as like a data security type of um, branch. Um, I mean, I just see it as a good crypto, but hey, more power to you. But you could see, you could, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in there. The Coinbase transaction in itself, you could just, you know, throw in random garbage, creating a, you know, completely random Coinbase transaction to create a completely random Merkle tree. So, um, you know, so there's practically infinitely many possibilities for a, a a block header. We're actually allowed to vary the timestamp by a lot to, as well. There's actually no real uh, hard requirement in the core software um, enforcing a timestamp except for a minimum time, which is basically the timestamp of the previous block plus one. Um, so we could, you know, I mean, uh, different chains have different goals for their block times. Bitcoin's goal is 10 minutes um, and Digibyte's goal is 15 seconds. Um, but neither one of them has like any sort of timing requirement enforcing that goal. The only way that goal is enforced is by adjusting the difficulty, the n bits parameter, uh, um, the difficulty of the network. Um, if, if you get a lot of timestamps, you know, you program in a specified time between blocks that you expect, you know, um, and that's in seconds. So, you know, for Digibytes 15 and then 10 times 60, it'd be 600 uh, seconds, right, for Bitcoin. And so if you start getting a lot of blocks that are much, um, uh, you know, uh, with less time in between than that goal, you're going to raise the difficulty of the network. So the, the thought being that, you know, the next few blocks are going to take longer to mine because they're gonna take more guesses. It's gonna take longer for miners to be able to find a valid block. Different chains calculate new difficulties at different rates. Uh, so for Bitcoin, it actually calculates a new difficulty every 2016 blocks, um, which at 10 minutes a block is two weeks. Uh, so, um, Digibyte updates its uh, its difficulty every single block, so it's constantly in flux. Um, so what that means for Bitcoin is that it, it sometimes can overshoot and sometimes it can undershoot. It's trying to take a perfect 14 days to calculate 2016 blocks, um, but you know it's possible it could take you know 12 days. It'll mine them faster than normal, or it's possible it could take 16 days. It can mine them slower. It all depends on how many miners are participating in a network at that time. Over time, though, it's actually proven to be a pretty uh, consistent timekeeping method. It's it's more or less accurate enough for you know the purposes that it's really trying to solve. It's it's not trying to be a clock, right? It's trying to be a a, a, a distributed ledger, and you know um, for not trying to be a clock, it's a damn good clock.
So if the network calculates that, you know, it took uh, less than or longer than 14 days to calculate those 2016 blocks, then, you know, if it took uh, less than, then it's going to make the difficulty higher to try and make it take longer. If it took longer than 14 days, it'll lower the difficulty to try and bring it back to 14 days. I just want to take a minute to really talk about the real impact of what what that simple little algorithm really does and, and really what a beautiful thing it is. So think about it for a second. This algorithm does something really simple, right? All it's looking for is a, um, a block header, these 640 bits where you hash it and it gives you a difficult uh, a digest that is below a difficulty. Um, and then all it does is if it gets a lot of these in too short of a time span, it'll make the difficulty higher. Um, sort of naturally making it so that it can't get more of these or it, you know, the inflow of new valid blocks is going to have to slow down only because it's going to take longer to try to guess or it's going to take more guesses to try and get another good block header. This is, this is, it's such a simple algorithm. It's honestly really easy to code up if you really think about it. And it's really beautiful. What this really does is it imposes a real world economic restraint on pure mathematics. And Bitcoin's not even the first use of proof of work to impose this real world economic constraint. The, the first use of proof of work was actually put in place to stop spam emails. It's a really quick, easy way to uh, prevent someone from sending out, you know, trillions of emails for nothing, right? You, you make them just do a quick little proof of work on it. They, you know, it forces it to slow down a little bit. And, uh, and, you know, all of a sudden sending a trillion spam emails doesn't seem like that great of an idea. What Bitcoin did was came along and married the idea of proof of work, the economic restraint from proof of work with the economic incentive of keeping track of a distributed ledger. It's, it's really, it truly is a miracle of our time. Also, you can come check out the official uh, Bitcoin developer documentation. It's just developer.bitcoin.org slash reference. And here you can find more or less the same information. It describes the, um, the same data, the, the data that you need to, you know, hash for proof of work and then a, sort of an example of what that might look like. Um, and then it has a little rundown of, you know, Merkle trees and how to calculate the difficulty from the end bits that you get. So I want to show you guys how you can query for all that information to mine, you know, crypto uh, directly from a full node yourself. And um, I actually can't run the Bitcoin core on my laptop because it requires something like 260 gigs of data. And this is a small laptop. I only have 256 uh, gigs of hard drive space, but Digibyte is small enough. So here I'm going to show you what the uh, um, GUI version, the Digibyte-QT version looks like. Okay, so it takes a minute to open, but this is what it looks like. It's so, uh, you know, shows you it's a pretty simple, you know, wallet GUI. It, you know, shows you how much, uh, how many coins you currently have available. I have one Digibyte on this wallet here. Um, and, you know, I sent one Digibyte. This is a little test I did. I actually did this live in a, a crypto meetup a few months ago. Um, but, but so this version is actually not what I want. So um, you could actually choose to run a the core of a blockchain um, in either this GUI way, or you could go over here to this folder daemon and open Digibyte D, or, or it would be Bitcoin D in the case of Bitcoin. Um, so let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so Digibyte D is all running, and uh, you could see it's sort of uh, just getting blocks every now and then. I found one for Skyn, found that one for Skyn, found this one with SHA-256. Um, uh, so why in the world do I want to run it this way instead of that nice convenient GUI way? Um, so the reason I want to do it that way is because it exposes all of these convenient API calls. Um, and note that Digibyte Core is basically a clone of Bitcoin Core, so all of these API calls are valid. And so we got some things here like uh, get mining info or get block template or uh, get balance. So this is how we could check how much uh, how many um, coins we actually have at that balance. So uh, we do that. We're going to use this API by using this inline, this command line uh, software, uh, this little client to actually access this Digibyte D core software from the command line. So let's open up a command window and let's navigate into that folder over there. So up to levels and then program files, CD Digibyte, CD daemon. Okay, and if I press stir, you can see there's a Digibyte Cli, so I'm in the right spot. So I type Digibyte Cli. Um, of course, if this is Bitcoin, you would type Bitcoin Cli, but of course, we're working with Digibyte. Digibyte Cli, and then let's check our balance. Get balance. And indeed, I have one Digibyte. 
I am rich. <laughs> okay, so uh, we don't want the balance though, right? We are doing this so we can get the information we need to mine, and we do that with this call, get block template. So digibyte cli get block template. And it returns a whole bunch of information. Um, and this is what we need to start mining. There's the version, we need the version, right? Um, and then we need the previous block hash. Um, and then we need the Merkle root, which is, well, here are the transactions. No transactions are in the mempool right now. Um, so we would use this to construct the Merkle, uh, the Merkle root along with the Coinbase value to construct the Merkle root. Um, here's the minimum time. So whatever time we pick needs to be at least this value greater than, um, and then, uh, there is n bits bits right here. This is n bits. So there you can see, um, except for the nonce, we have all of the values that we need. Uh, we have the version, the previous hash. We can make the Merkle root. We have to make it ourselves. Um, there's a, a minimum time. It's very forgiving with which time we use. And then there's the difficulty bits. Now it's up to us to find a nonce. Um, so it's, it's, it's not too hard, right? Nothing, nothing to no, no smoke and mirrors here. So you see, it's not too hard to get the information you need if you're running the full node locally on your machine, which, uh, honestly, if you can, I recommend everyone do it, um, Bitcoin or Digibyte. I mean, they're, uh, it's both a good learning experience and you want to help the network grow and succeed. Right. Um, so what we're going to do actually is build something that talks to a mining pool. So we're not going to have a node running locally. We're not going to depend on a node running locally for our mining software. What we're going to do is we're going to communicate out to a, uh, um, a, a pool that, you know, pulls together the efforts of lots of miners to try and mine blocks on a blockchain. Um, and we're going to ask them to give us the information for work. And all that really means is that pool is operating a node themselves and they are then getting this information and they are now disseminating that out to a bunch of helpers to have them, you know, submit guesses for um, a, a possible block that that miner can now submit to the blockchain. All of the block rewards would go to that miner's node, the one that they're running locally there. Um, and then, you know, it'd be up to the miner to now distribute that out fairly to all the, um, uh, the, the other miners that submitted work to that. And, you know, so actually, so, you know, this means the miner could keep all of the money, but of course the economic incentive is to provide an honest business. Cause you know, if you keep all the money, you could do that maybe once before people stop using your service. Right. Um, okay. So, but using a distributed mining system like this with, you know, everything going back to one node, you, you, you need to come up with a way to make it so that all your different miners are actually working on um, different Merkle trees so that no one is, uh, you know, we're not checking the same nonce twice. Everyone is doing unique work. Everyone has a fair chance of doing it. And how that happens um, is the introduction of two fields in the Coinbase transaction. Uh, they're very creatively named extra nonce one and extra nonce two. <laughs> extra nonce one is how a mining pool is going to have unique work go out to all its different workers that are talking to it. Um, so uh, what that means is, you know, if I'm the pool, I'll assign uh, to, to the first worker, you know, extra nonce zero and then to the second worker, extra nonce one. And usually when you're, when you're, you know, a miner, you're just going to take that extra nonce and you're not going to try and change it. Extra nonce two, on the other hand, is changed by the miner locally. Every single worker is going to have access to change that um, extra nonce two. And the whole reason for it existing is just because mining hardware is so uh, blazingly fast now. Um, so without the extra nonce two, uh, a mining worker would basically get this information from the pool and we're not really going to question it. We're not going to um, uh, build our entire list of Merkle trees. The pool will probably do that for us, right? Uh, we're going to get a Merkle root. Well, we'll probably get the Coinbase halves, like Coinbase parts, and construct the Merkle root from that. But we're not going to mess with the time. We're not going to mess with the Merkle root too much. Um, we're just going to take what the pool gives us. Um, so without the variability from those fields, we only have the nonce to work with. And the nonce is 32 bits. Uh, so 2 to the 32 is something like 4 billion, right? Um, but Nowadays, we have, you know, Antminer S19s, Bitcoin miners that mine the SHA-256 algorithm, um, can mine at like 110 terahash per second. So if there's only 4 billion possible values in the nonce, and uh, an Antminer, an S19, is 110, 110 terahash per second, that means it could do those 4 billion guesses in like less than a, a micro, like a microsecond, a few microseconds, something like that, right? Um, so we just need more than those 32 bits. And that's where the extra nonce two comes in. 
it's usually another 32 bits that is not a hard definition but it is usually enough and so it's, it's usually another 32 uh, bits four bytes um, and you vary it just like you would nonce when we're going to be checking for what nonce works we're just going to start at zero right and we're just going to count up does zero work no does one work no right um, we're doing the same thing with extra nonce both start at zero check all of the nonces and then go increment extra nonce and then check all of the nonces again um, you don't want to vary extra nonce uh, you want to check all of the nonsense before you change extra nonce two, because changing extra nonce two means we have to recalculate the Merkle root. Um, so if we don't have to redo work, let's try and not redo work, right? Okay, so we got some background now as to what the heck is going on. So we can go ahead and uh, start actually planning out what our software is going to be doing, right? Um, so the general architecture of the whole system that we're going to do is, is um, we have been working on the FPGA hardware, right? And now we've got this RS32 communication all worked out. So now we're gonna write the processor software, um, which is gonna communicate to a mining pool. And that's how we're gonna get the information that we need to, you know, to actually start uh, plugging something into our hashing so uh, firmware. Um, so the, the software, it's pretty straightforward it needs to do. It needs to basically open the communication with the mining pool, um, do some setup things, right? And then it needs to open the communication with the FPGA. Um, and then it's basically going to loop forever. It's going to send the info from the mining pool out to the FPGA. The FPGA is going to do its thing. And we're going to cross our fingers and hope that um, the FPGA spits out a nonce to us. If we get a nonce from the FPGA, then we're going to write that out to the mining pool. And the mining pool should give us some shares of the next reward that it gets. Um, you know, for contributing that work. Um, and then here's a little overview of what the uh, hashing, of what the FPGA firmware will look like. So we got the receive and send already worked out, right? Um, we, we got the receive buffer worked out. Um, so we got a few more modules we're gonna have to um, uh, build to actually uh, support um, an actual, you know, mining. Um, but, you know, that's okay. We're gonna work that out after we get this software worked out. Um, so you know, again, pretty straightforward. Now that you know we actually know what we're doing, it's it's uh, it's more or less straightforward script. So for the scripts we're gonna write, I think uh, we're gonna go with Zerg pool for the pool to use. Um, I, I like this one. I kind I was really thinking about which pool to use for these example videos. So Zerg pool is, an, is a multi coin pool, and and you can mine SHA two fifty six on it. But they actually don't mine Bitcoin. They mine basically everything but Bitcoin, and they let you uh, um, auto convert it to Bitcoin. Um, but you know, so so uh, I was debating whether I wanted to do something like slush pool or something. But I've worked with Zerg pool. It, their stratum works really good. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, we're not gonna be mining Bitcoin specifically, but we are gonna be mining SHA-256. So. Uh, if you just find a different pool, um, you should be able to more or less use the same software. So the plan is to write this Python script for mining over the next two videos. Uh, the next video what we're going to do is we're going to focus on making a test bench for the hashing algorithm. We're going to use SHA-256, that's SHA-256. Um, that stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. The 256 just means that it spits out a 256-bit digest. Um, it could actually take uh, almost any variable length input and then after that we'll actually set up the communication with the mining pool um, and that is going to involve learning the protocol that you know uh, that is used to communicate with mining pools it's called stratum um, it's it's pretty easy it's a it's a way to format json packets to um, get the information that you know uh, we need from the pool and to give them the information they need from us so if you want to learn how to do that, then make sure you hit subscribe so you can see those videos when I release them. Um, and if you liked this video, make sure you press like and then you know drop a comment down below saying this is dope, you know? All right. Um, so this has been a ton of fun. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.